welcome everybody and um, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's thinking sometimes you know we we, we do these events uh, in the middle of an investigation where we're um we're already down the road other times it feels like um someone says something so surprising that we realize a story's walked into our newsroom and we um think well we better get after it i think tonight uh, what we're trying to do is i can hardly think of a more uh, grave and serious subject for us to to tackle um and what we're really aiming to do is is just sharpen the focus really of an investigation that we've already uh, begun into um the 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 question of um really hidden homicides um and how we're framing it tonight how many murders go unreported it's about um violence in a in a domestic setting and you know as as this night goes on we'll we'll really realize that there are some chilling trends and some really terrible statistics um with obviously human stories attached to them all so what i'm hoping that we're gonna do is you know we've got a lot of expert voices in the room tonight um and by bringing you all together we might just get a sense of where um the information we've gathered so far can take us. And I think we're very lucky um, to have with us tonight um, Louise Tickle, who's a journalist who um, we've worked with a couple of times at Tortoise. And she's, um, if, if you have, I suppose there she is. Hello, how are you? Um, Louise is one of those rare um, creatures who's actually been out in the world doing journalism and talking to real people in the last period. So. Um, she deserves respect for that, but also I, I think you know if anyone has followed her career, if you want to know what a what a proper determined forensic journalist looks like, then she's in the room tonight, and she's written memorably for us about um, the family courts and how they handle domestic abuse cases, and uh, in July wrote an absolutely devastating piece about what's happened to child protection during lockdown, and I think it got. A massive amount of respect um, in the wider world. So she's well used to trying to prise open um, closed worlds, but um, I think this is a this is a particularly um, contentious area, uh, and I'm really hoping that you know together we're gonna we're gonna help shape the the work that she does. I I just want to say just by way of intro as well that. You know, it's it's pretty obvious that this is this is wrenching stuff that we're talking about tonight, and um, you know, it's undoubtedly going to go into some upsetting territory. So I just want to um, say that at the outset. And there are some people on the call who joining us who have direct personal experience of, um, of some of the events we're talking about. So um, we should uh, we should steal ourselves for that, and, and, and also you know, just want to create a, a space where you know people should feel comfortable to share as much or as little as they want uh, and again you know i suppose it's right to say that because it's so legally contentious some of this stuff um we should be aware that um you know we need to think about live proceedings uh, at all times when we're talking about specific cases um, but let's get started if we can then uh, louise i'll come to you first if you don't mind um just give me a sense of, um, well, really what drew you to, to the subject in the first place? I have been following um, and reporting on domestic abuse for about seven or eight years now. Um, I looked at the new coercive control law, so newish, um, at lenient sentencing when people are convicted of domestic abuse crimes and of the incredible um, lack of concern there seems to be when people breach the protective orders that courts try to try to use to be able to protect people. Um, but I think what, what I've noticed over that time during which I, I have come to know Professor Munson Smith who joins us tonight and Frank Mullane who I hope will join us is in following their work, you start to see that although we're very familiar with the, the figure two women a week um, dying at the hands of a, of a partner or ex-partner or indeed family member, which is a horrific enough figure um, and sad that it just rolls off the tongue now. Mm -hmm. um, what I've become aware of is that other deaths, which 
could be suspicious seem to be going unnoticed and uninvestigated. And the, the issue starts to, to kind of come to the top of your mind when just a very odd case breaks through into the news environment. So people will remember um, the children's author, Helen Bailey, who disappeared um, in 2016, I think it was. And her body was found three months later, buried in a cesspit in her own property. Now, her partner has been convicted of her murder. Um, and there's very little more I can say about the fact that he's been charged now with the murder of his former wife because those are live proceedings. But that was one of the, the things that kind of sparked my interest. And there was an, a previous case um, which is going through uh, a judicial review at the moment where a woman called Susan Nicholson, whose family fought so hard for her death to be recognized as murder. Um, her mum and dad, they spent their life savings. They went to the ends of the earth to show that the police had not investigated properly. And subsequently, it was, it was discovered that the man who is now convicted of, Car of Susan Nicholson's death and of his previous partner's manslaughter had in fact had two girlfriends die in very similar circumstances with him. And there is a very big, long, strong and painful history of domestic abuse in that case. Mm -hmm. So I guess you start to see these things happening and you always know that what gets reported is the tip of an iceberg and that so much never makes it to court, never gets past the burden of proof, never even gets investigated. And so at the beginning of lockdown, when there was so much concern about how domestic abuse victims would cope in this hidden world behind closed doors. Mm. Jane and I spoke and I found out more about the research she's doing, which I'm sure she will talk about. Um, and I started to realize that there are some really important questions that need to be asked in this situation. You know, why are families having to fight so hard to get the police to even investigate a, a death as suspicious when there's been a very long history of recorded domestic abuse. Are state agencies so blind to domestic abuse that they're simply not willing to consider it? Mm. Have cuts to police been so massive that there's no longer the capacity, the staffing, or perhaps even the expertise left to see a death and recognize it as suspicious? And why are there such delays um, when it comes to both getting inquests to mm. rigorously examine what a cause of death was and why are there such delays to domestic homicide reviews which are home office reviews that that are undertaken when there's a death with a strong history of domestic abuse and another lady who joins us tonight julie onger um will be able to talk um about the fight she's had um to secure a review into the death of her daughter yes well, thank you for that. And let's just um, let's just do a, a really basic question before we go any further. Just do you tell me um, when we talk about homicides, what do we mean by that? Well, we, we, we mean um, that somebody has caused someone else's death. Now, there are there are various kinds of, of, of classifications of killing. So Jane will go go more into how, she, how she's having to think really hard about how she defines the scope of her research and what makes a domestic homicide? How is she framing that? Um, but I mean, the, the, the fact is that when police arrive at a death, um, they have a choice of how they look at that death. They can investigate it as, as one of, you know, several things as an unlawful killing, as a homicide, as a manslaughter, um, as an accidental death, mm -hmm. as a non-suspicious death. And the decisions that police make in those you know, first days, even first minutes, can absolutely direct the trajectory of what happens for that person who's died and for their family from that point forward. Right. And and just before we, we start to extend the conversation, just tell me a little bit more about the, the significance of the Susan Nicholson case, because it happens that... Um, it's, it's going on this week at the High Court, isn't it? The Judicial Review. I think it was postponed from March because of um, the coronavirus. And, and this is a case where, where really, as, as I think you said, her parents were, um, you know, far more diligent and more successful in their investigations than, than Sussex police. Yeah. Um, what, what's, at, what's at issue in the High Court? Well, when Robert Trigg was convicted of Susan Nicholson's murder and the manslaughter of his former partner, Caroline Devlin, um, 
the, in the, the inquest verdicts that had been reached on both of those women's deaths were quashed. And uh, the coroner decided to, to issue a, a sort of short inquest and she, she issued an unlawful killing verdict um, mm. on Caroline Devlin. Um, but the Nicholson, Susan Nicholson's family, Mr. and Mrs. Skelton, um, were really unhappy at the idea that there would simply be that verdict for their daughter. They wanted to get a full Article 2 compliant inquest. And what that means is you get those kinds of inquests when the state has a positive duty to protect someone's life, which they know to be at immediate risk. And so what they're arguing for at the moment um, in this judicial review is for the right to have an Article 2 inquest, which the coroner is resisting, has refused already, and which the police are fighting. Um, and have I, sorry to interrupt you, Louise. Have I, have I understood correctly that, um, that that part of the reason they want that, the family, is, is that they want to be able to um, ask questions of police in a public forum yeah. under oath? Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's what is able to happen much more simply in an Article 2 inquest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can always call police, but that they will be, if, if it's granted, they would then be called to justify the things that they should have done that they didn't do to protect Susan Nicholson's life at a time when their, her family argues they had plenty enough knowledge to be able to anticipate that she was at very serious risk. Okay, Louise, well, thank you so much for, um, for setting us on our way like that. I'm going to introduce Jane Moncton-Smith, who I believe, um, as of not very long ago, we um, we now call Professor, not Doctor. Is that correct, Jane? That's correct. Well, congratulations. That's um, that's very auspicious. And you're you're joining us from um, well, I know you're University of Gloucester, aren't you? You joining us from Cheltenham tonight? I am. So, tell us a little bit about about your work, uh, and and uh, and if you don't mind, um, tell us a little bit about what a domestic homicide review is as well. Um, well, I, I, probably Frank would be a very good person to speak to you about how to define what a domestic homicide review is. I can only say that, um, very broadly speaking, it's a review into the circumstances surrounding uh, somebody's death, whether it is suspected to be or known to be domestic abuse in the antecedent history. So, and the purpose of the review is to try and stop future homicide. So let's see what happened. Let, let, let's see if there's anything we could have done differently um, to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Broadly speaking, that's what a domestic homicide review is. And, and have I got this right? They're ordered by the Home Office and, and you have supervised quite a number of them. Is that right? Yes, I, uh, I do chair these homicide reviews. I've done quite a few. I also um, give advice to, to panels and other chairs on, because some of these homicides are really quite complex and we are still catching up with a lot of the knowledge about domestic abuse and coercive control and intimate, intimate partner stalking. Um, I think there's an assumption that we, we all know how dangerous these things are, but really, from my work, um, we need a lot more knowledge. And again, I, I know Louise has um, has told me that you you've essentially built up a case file of of at least twenty cases that are very concerning for you. Um, I wonder if um, you could just give us a sense. I realise we're about to sort of delve into. Uh, in some of the, the grim nature of this, but what are the patterns that you see in some of these cases? Well, um, I, I think if I, if I was to say that, you know, I, I have done some research recently, which has tracked a journey to homicide in these cases. Of course, a lot of people will have heard me talking about this, will know about it, um, the eight stages to homicide. Mm. Um, and what I've been trying to, to do is look, say, this journey, this eight stage journey is so typical, so common that we should actually be every sudden death, unexpected sudden death where we th think, you know, there has been domestic abuse or we know there has, as we do in, in many cases, we should be at least making the assumption that we should be looking 
deeper rather than what appears to happen is that we just find any excuse for not recording it as a homicide and making it go away. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the cases, I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk about the kind of, um, maybe the kind of cases I'm talking about. Give some uh, yeah, talking, again, I mean, you know, mindful of... Uh... Being maintaining confidentiality, of course, yes. Indeed, and 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 also, I mean, you know, clearly we. Um, I, I accept this as distressing stuff, but um, you know, we. Well, I'll just speak very broadly then, uh, very broadly. Um, some of some of the deaths that I have been looking at, and I can tell you, it's more than twenty. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about, if you look at the work that's been done around sex games gone wrong, mm -hmm. um, it when there is a death caused by drug intoxication of somebody who's never taken drugs before is is known you know to to not take drugs in fact um we're talking about suicides maybe staged suicides and and i have a number of cases where it has been considered that there are no su suspicious circumstances whatsoever i mean mercy killings is another one we really have only skimmed the surface on the numbers here and and you and you seem to be recognizing common traits. And uh, again, I, I wonder if I'm sure people would be interested to hear you just rattle through the the eight stages to homicide as well, because I'm sure that's very instructive. Well, I um, well, well the, the the eight stages is um, yeah. So it it tracks the 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 history of the person. So we we have to recognize in this model that if somebody has a history of domestic abuse mm -hmm. uh, coercive control and stalking then that let's start to accept that that is that person we tend to think or approach the situation that it's just the dynamic between two people that's creating the problem and if they just split up everything would go away that it could not be further from the truth the the issue is that if somebody has a history then they are much higher risk for going through all of the eight stages. And so that's where the eight stages starts. And we progress through to um, a relationship where control is the most important thing, where they are exerting control. They may exert control through violence. They may not, a lot of them do. But the eight stages starts to get really important when we get around stage four, which is the trigger stage. And what we do know from global research, it's not like this stuff is hidden, um, is that any kind of separation, so that is an imagined, uh, a real or a threatened separation, raises the risk for harm. Um, incre <laughs> incredibly, um, it, it is it, seriously. And we're, we're, we're going to deaths, for example, where there's been a clear stage four, there has been a separation and, and people are not, professionals are not seeing that as important. So the next, just very briefly to cover the next stages, once you've got a trigger, which is usually a separation, but can be related to other things like ill health, financial ruin, that kind of thing. There is generally an escalation period where the dangerous person's behavior gets more dangerous, noticeably dangerous and that that can continue on then if that escalation continues it can end in a homicide i mean i don't want to go through each of the eight stages sure. and, so, and, and and it's the case that uh, well we can get to questions of systemic failure later but it's it's mm -hmm. from from what you've suggested there um reading between the lines police forces that ought to be well versed in this perhaps aren't well can i just say as well yeah, we can land a lot of this at the door of the police, mm -hmm. but I'm afraid we have to learn some of it at the door of the coroners and the pathologists as well. Okay, you've you've definitely teed up the second half of this conversation. <laughs> um, good. Now, um, thank you for that. Let's um, let's bring um, Frank Mullane into the conversation. Frank, are you with us? There you go, Frank. Thank you for joining us, Frank's. Um, well, well, why don't you tell us? Um, what your position is, Frank, and the organisation that you are uh, the head of? I started the organisation called Advocacy After Fatal Domestic Abuse, or AFTA, uh, for the reasons that Jane has outlined, Rudy. Uh, a number of my own 
family suffered double murder and the perpetrator took his life afterwards. So my sister and nephew were murdered. And my family had great difficulty in trying to bring about a deep inquiry. We found that we wanted to ask weren't received favorably. There were attempts to dislodge us and remove us and cause us difficulty for which we eventually received an apology. It's no surprise to me when I read about the difficulty other families have in trying to uh, initiate and sustain um, a campaign to get answers. Um, so after five years when my family had achieved its objectives pretty much so, I set up after uh, to help the other families that were contacting me. I've been doing that now since 2008. How many families but have you uh, worked with in that time? Hundreds of families. Hundreds of families? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. We wow. mostly help them on domestic homicide, suicide, and mm -hmm. deaths. We're helping nearly 40 families now, following uh, suicides or unexplained deaths, um, where there is a history of domestic abuse in the past. Doesn't mean that you can identify causation, but that relationship uh, between the history and and the death. And and again, I, I mean, this is it's difficult territory. This, but what what are the what are the familiar things that that come up again and again, as far as you're concerned? In terms of difficulties for families, I mean, Louise uh, said it very eloquently. The amount of effort that a family has to put in, and you'll hear this from Julie Anger later, mm -hmm. the amount of effort they have to put in is extraordinary and exponential just to achieve what most families want, really three things, that the story be told accurately of what happened, mm -hmm. that the family gets answers to their questions or knows that there are not answers. Because even the perception that there's answers out there is, is horrific. Yeah. Thirdly, that they are able to witness or testify to some form of change. Those objectives are very important mm -hmm. for most families. Yeah. Now, you, so as I understand it, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the domestic homicide reviews um, became part of the landscape in about what, 2011, am I right? Yes. And um, and you you clearly played a, a key role in in making that happen. Could you just talk about that for a little? Well, they were first introduced into Parliament in 2004. And my family had had an unsatisfactory inquest, uh, one which is called a Jenton inquest. And what Louise was referring to is after two inquests, uh, which are deeper and broader and extend mm -hmm. how questions that are kind of answered to include and in what circumstances. Our inquest was inadequate. We spoke to our MP and said, look, what, else, what can we do now? And she said, well, Parliament is talking about domestic homicide review. So they eventually became law in 2011. And I had a role with the previous government, the Labour government, in helping to construct that model, which I retained under the new administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and we eventually came up with a model in 2011. I, I had some part of that. Uh, don't blame me for the negative part of it. <laughs> okay, well- It's a bit arrogant, that. sorry. <laughs> we'll get to we'll get to um, how you feel they're they're continuing to function in a moment I think but um, well you you've mentioned Julia on Julia Anger um, and I know Julie's joining us from um, Paint in, in Devon today um, Julia I we tell me about your daughter Katie oh Katie was. Um... She was the baby of the family. My daughter, Emma, is also here. Um, she's on our, with us this evening. Um, Katie was the baby of the family. She was just 21 when she died. Um, she was in her first relationship. Um, she met an older man. Um, yeah, she, she, she fell for somebody who sold himself to her. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for giving me the opportunity of telling her. Um, and I, I have a script if you'd like me to, to share that with you, purely because... Whatever I, you I, feel comfortable with, um, I, you know, we're very grateful for you sharing your story. Thank you. I just wanted to, to um, share it. And if, if I write it down, then I feel that I've, I've said everything I need to say. So first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share Katie's story. I hope that it might inspire changes in the way that unexplained and sudden deaths 
in otherwise healthy people are looked at and investigated. I'd like to tell you three views of Katie's life and her death, all of which people have listened to and believed in various degrees. And by the end, I hope that you will see that not everything is black and white and that sometimes we need to scratch beneath the surface and trust our instincts when mm. the answers seem too easy. If I can, I'd start with the views of the social media that we had at the time. Katie and Mitchell, her ex-partner, were found both dead side by side at Mitchell's flat by his mother. Facebook was flooded with stories of what a close and loving couple they were, what a gentleman he was, and how good they were for each other. Mitchell's family stated online that their deaths were a classic case of Romeo and Juliet, that they weren't allowed to be together in life, so they chose to die together in a joint suicide pact. A photo of Katie and Mitchell were posted online and people commented about what a romantic photo it was, how tiny she was and how she fitted snugly into his huge arms. Stories were posted about what a good man Mitchell had been, but how life had treated him very badly. Words like tortured soul and hopefully he will find peace now were used. A second viewpoint, Katie was found lying next to Mitchell at his flat. She wouldn't have gone there in the first place, especially as she claimed that he'd hit her. Look at the photos of them together. She wouldn't have taken the photos if she didn't love him. They don't show any signs of abuse. Look, she's smiling. You could see how happy and devoted he was to her. She was lucky to have someone so protective of her. He wanted to give her everything. She was lucky that he let her give up her job to stay at home all day. I wish I had someone who wanted to look after me that much. She loved him so much that she would give up her life to be with him forever. It's so romantic. Then there's the classic, why didn't she just leave? But the background is this. Katie was a beautiful young woman. Now, yeah, I'm her mother, so I know I'm going to tell you that, but she was. Katie will always be 21. And that's one of the positives I have to tell myself every day. She'll always be beautiful. She'll always be 21. She met him at age 19 and his first words to her, I've been watching you. Oh. Within two weeks, he loved her. Two weeks later, he told her he was being evicted from his home and asked if he could move in with her just temporarily until he sorted himself out. It was at this point he admitted he was 12 years older than her, being 31 years old. He admitted he was wearing a tag for a violent offence, but that it was a miscarriage of justice and that he was innocent. We started hearing rumours that he would lose his temper often and smash up her flat. And when I asked Katie about this, she stated, yes, he had a temper, but he never hit her, just the walls. Well, apart from that one time, but that had been an accident when she got in the way of his fist and he was ever so sorry afterwards. After about two months of meeting, he walked into the hairdressers where she worked and started shouting in her face and spat at her. Two men from the barber's side got up to tell him to get out. He threw Katie's keys into her face. She was so ashamed, told me it was her fault as she hadn't left him enough milk for his coffee. <clears throat> After about two months, she was evicted from her flat because of his behaviour. And they moved into a flat that belonged to a friend of his. She was signed off work with stress, anxiety and depression after this. And he lost his job also because of the amount of time he was taking off to check up on her. For some reason, and for one I will never understand, but I'm eternally grateful for. The only person Katie was allowed to see was me. And throughout the summer of 2016, she would phone me late at night, at least a couple of times a week, to ask if she could come and stay, just to get away so he could calm down. By the time she arrived, he would either physically hurt her or spat at her, but always would have verbally and mentally or emotionally abused her. He would FaceTime her all night, so neither of them got any sleep, but he was allowed her to come as long as she could prove she was at my house. After one such evening, I phoned Katie to see if she was OK. I spoke to her for about half an hour, with him listening into the conversation as always. I told them both how worried I was for Katie and that his obvious... His anger was obviously escalating. I asked him to get some help for both his anger and his very obvious drug problem. He did admit that his anger was getting worse. And he said that he tried all sorts of anger management therapies, the last one being a talking therapy, but he said they were all rubbish. 
He said he loved Katie and wanted to protect her. I said I felt she needed protecting from him. He laughed and said I was probably right. I said I would support him if Katie wanted me to, as all I wanted was for her to be happy, but more importantly, safe. He cried and said he loved her so much and would do anything to keep her. After smashing her phone again, he bought her a new phone and installed a tracking device on it so that he could see where she was at all times. She believed this was for her safety. On the 8th of October, 2016, Katie phoned and asked if I would help her to move into a new flat, just her, as she was ready to leave him. She'd made an appointment to see one the next day. She asked me to go with her to view it, but said that Mitchell must not find out. I was thrilled that she had finally was ready to leave. However, later that night, he went through her handbag and found a scrap of the flat's to let's page and realised that she was planning to leave. He stood on the balcony of their third floor flat and threatened to throw himself off if she left him. He then took some cocaine and told her he had taken enough sleeping tablets, cocaine and alcohol to kill himself and that he wanted to die if he couldn't have Katie. He told her it would be her fault. He repeatedly hit her and spat at her. Her nose was bleeding and she thought he had broken her nose and her jaw. Fortunately, this wasn't the case. That's not a sentence you ever imagine you'll be happy saying. The neighbours called the police as he could hear them beating her. This was not the first time the neighbours had heard Mitchell beating Katie, but they stated to the police this was the worst it had ever been and they were worried for her life. We spent that morning whilst he was in police custody, removing all of his details from our online accounts. We contacted Apple who removed a tracking device and all of the passwords that he had access to. He knew them all, her bank account, her emails, her Facebook. The police phoned later that night to say that Mitchell was going to be released on conditional bail in the next few hours. He was not to go near Katie, contact her indirectly or directly, where she worked, me or my home. However, on release, he immediately started to phone her. He told her he had bought £300 worth of cocaine and that he was going to kill himself. When this didn't make Katie tell him where she was, he told her he was standing outside her window watching her. He then said he would smash up her car if she didn't tell him where she was. He also told her he had intimate photos and videos of her and he was going to post them online for the world to see. Katie blocked his number and then he phoned me. He got really angry and said if he couldn't have her, then no one else could. He told me he could easily kill her with drugs, that nobody would ever be able to prove it. We had been told if Katie was in immediate danger to phone 999, otherwise to phone the non-urgent number. As he didn't know where Katie was, we phoned 101 to report his phone calls. Eventually, I spoke to a man who took all of my details, but said the team who were dealing with the case were off duty for two days but that he'd put a note on the file and that somebody would call me back on Wednesday. Two days later, at about 8am, a lady from the Sodate team called me. She said she'd thrown her toys out of the pram when she had seen the note of my call from two days ago regarding Mitchell's threats. She said 101 should have escalated the call as he had broken his bail conditions. She said the police were already on their way to try and find him to arrest him and asked me to go to the police station to give a formal statement. I tried to phone Katie, but it went to answer phone. I texted her, messaged her, she didn't reply. I kept phoning every 20 minutes or so, but her phone remained switched off. I was so concerned by now that I tried Mitchell's phone, that went straight to answer phone. I kept trying Katie, but it remained off. I got to the police station and told the female police officer that I was so worried for Katie's safety. They took me very seriously and sent another team out to look for him. The police continued to look for him for the rest of that day and the following day. Katie was missing and so was he. They had both of their car registration numbers and they were actively out searching, as were we and our family. At approximately 7.30am, two days later, on the Friday morning, a text came from Katie's phone asking for £200 to be paid into a bank account, saying she'd pay me back later that day when she got paid. She would have seen so many worried messages from me when she turned her phone on. Something wasn't right. 
Andy, my husband, drove straight to Mitchell's flat and neither car was there. He then drove to Katie's flat, which we'd driven past and knocked on the door many, many times. Mitchell's car was parked outside. I phoned the police to arrive within 10 minutes. They found Mitchell inside with Katie, who was very badly beaten. The police phoned me straight away to come and see her as she was in such a mess. Katie told me that Mitchell had messaged her in the night to say he was cold. It was the middle of the night, that he was sorry and that he loved her. She told him where he lived, she lived, and let him in for a cup of tea after he promised to behave. He'd beaten her on and off for hours. She was black and blue, with bruises on her face, her arms, her wrists, and her neck, where he tried to strangle her on more than one occasion. It was he who had made Katie send me the text asking for money. As he said, he wanted £200 to buy enough drugs to kill Katie first, come and find me to tell me what he had done, and then kill me. He told her he would then kill himself, and wouldn't it be funny that it was my money using it to do all of that? When I arrived, the officer at the flat said that in his opinion, if they hadn't arrived when they did, then Katie would be dead. Katie told me that when she heard the policeman's footsteps coming up the stairs, she'd started to believe she would live to see me again she was convinced she was going to die. She gave a video statement where she showed how he would hit her over and over again with this part of his, his, his hands, how he had repeatedly put his hands around her neck, thrown her phone at her and told her to call the police. When she'd grabbed the phone to phone, he told her, by the time they get here, I will have killed you and I'll take out everyone who comes through that door as well. After he was arrested, Mitchell was put on suicide watch when he was first taken to the police station, as he said he wanted to kill himself for what he had done to Katie. The police installed a panic alarm in Katie's flat that evening. We got a call later that day to say he had pleaded guilty to beating Katie twice, resisting arrest and criminal damage, and would be taken to Plymouth Magistrates Court the following morning. We were told the CPS have dropped the charges of kidnap and holding her against her will and the threats to kill they couldn't prove this as it would be Katie's word against his, but the beatings could be proved by the video and the bruises. Plymouth Magistrates Court released Mitchell on the same conditional bail that the police had released him on just a few days earlier, with a court date set for sentencing for two weeks later. She started to see her friends again, and they will tell you how excited she was at her new life, how she loved her new flat, she was very positive about her future. She told me it was great just to be able to shave her legs without having to explain why. She said she was enjoying not feeling like she was walking on eggshells all of the time and just having the freedom to come and go as she pleased. On 7.15, on the 14th of November, 2016, there was a knock on my front door. I went to answer it. There was a policeman stood in the doorway and I knew, I just knew. At the inquest, which was a joint inquest with both families in the same room, Mitchell's mother stated that she had been the one to find my daughter and her son dead. She said she walked around the bodies, removed tissues, poured away liquids in multiple glasses found in the lounge and next to where Katie and he were found, washed up these glasses, removed tablets and threw these down the sink. She said she had spent about an hour cleaning the flat before she phoned someone. This wasn't 999. This was not even somebody who was medically trained. She phoned a friend and asked them to come to the flat as she had found Mitchell and Katie and she didn't know if they were dead. Could Katie have been saved? Was she alive the whole time? And why did his mother not call an ambulance or the police or just scream? When we asked the police if she had been questioned about this as she had admitted tampering with evidence, we were told by the lead officer they were not prepared to question her. If she was grieving, she just lost her son, you know. We asked if they could ask her about anything else she'd found and were told it would not change anything, even if she had found something. Katie died from drugs, end of story. We were told, and I quote, once it was confirmed that drugs were the cause of death, they, the police, removed the resources from the case to enable them to focus on live cases. I did ask if this was opposed to the dead cases, but he didn't seem to understand the painful comment he'd just made. 
At the inquest, the coroner found that the police had carried out a poor investigation into the death of my daughter and stated that assumptions were made. The outcome was recorded as the cause of death being a combination of cocaine and morphine, where the method and intention remain unclear. She stated that the police should have asked questions of Mitchell's mother and brother, and that because of this, we will never know what happened that night. We know what happened that night. Four weeks earlier, Katie had been found to be a high risk by MARAC, the multi-agencies. The domestic violence police officer who attended Katie's inquest stated that Katie was broken. The officer who met with Katie at the police station stated Katie appeared very young and vulnerable. Mitchell Richardson told me he would kill my daughter with drugs and I would never prove it. And four weeks later, she was found with him, the cause of death, drugs. And the police want me to ignore all of the previous domestic violence, the coercive control, the threats to kill her by the very way in which she died and believe that this was Katie's decision. Katie's choice to be with the man who had held her against her will for almost two days, beating her black and blue and threatening to kill her just a couple of weeks before. We made a complaint against the police and the investigation after being told all was well twice. The police finally upheld four out of five of our complaints. The police carried out a poor investigation into Katie's death. The lead officers were not aware of all the facts and evidence and did not take statements from key witnesses that the length of time to get to inquest was too long and that they failed to communicate with me and ignored repeated requests for contact. The only one they did not put hold did not upheld was that they did not take the threats to kill seriously, stating there is no record of me ever saying that. Why do they think I would lie? I'm not the criminal here. We have spent two years fighting our local community safety partnership for a domestic homicide review, which would look at the circumstances leading up to Katie's death. We have finally won the battle. And yesterday, with AFTA's help, we met with the chair who has been commissioned to lead our review although we have had to agree to call a review a domestic abuse related death review and not a domestic homicide review. Katie gave a video interview to the police just four weeks before she died, stating so many examples of coercive control, but this was ignored when she was alive. Our family continue to make sure her voice is heard and make a difference to future vulnerable Katies and in the hope that the mistakes and assumptions that were made with my daughter are not made again the police start to look beyond sudden deaths after domestic violence, whether they're drug related, suicide or simply unexplained, and listen to the family and friends of the victim. After all, we know them much better than anyone. The victim is not just a statistic or a case number. But she's a much loved family member who deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Thank you for listening. Julia, um... <laughs> I'm absolutely overwhelmed by by your story and the way you've told it. Um, it's 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 far from typical for us to spend quite so long of a session like this on on one person's testimony. But I really feel that that was um, that you spoke so compellingly and and that was so moving and really crystallises so many of the issues that uh, we wanted to talk about. So I'm I'm thank you for sharing and and. I'm glad that your your family has had some comfort in the last couple of days, uh, and it's clearly not over for you. But um, it's a remarkable um, account that you've given, and a very distressing one as well. Um, I'm sure everyone here feels humbled um, to hear from you. Um, I think if if people feel that we we need to take a little more time, we could go over um, seven thirty and and. Um, just get around some of the issues that that we well that your case and katie's story raises um i'm gonna go somewhere else because i feel a little bit full after that i must say um um and my, my colleagues have um mindful of the fact that um that we're gonna we're gonna sort of take the um take the heat out of the room in some ways and this is not the 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 personal story this really is the sort of um the the statistical landscape, but zav has been doing some research in this area, and I think it has a, a few graphics that we'd like to go through that just give us a sense of the scale of what we're talking about here. Zav, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, they should appear in a second. Um, so yeah, as you've said, um, 
you know, none of these deaths should be treated as a statistic. Um, but just looking at the past 10 years, um, this slide shows us how many women are killed by men every year in the UK. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, in the last year for which we had data, that number was 149, which was the highest in the decade. And there were a further 17 suspected femicides, women killed by men, which went unsolved. And it should be said, we only had this data because of the femicide census, which was launched in 2015. And the founders of that census saw that there was a real lack of collated information on women killed by men, especially in domestic settings. And so they started this census. And if we go to the next slide, um, when we widen the scope to homicides, so include women killed by men or by other women or without a suspect, you can see well over a third of homicides against women had no suspect whatsoever. Uh, and when there was one, 38% of the time, it was a partner or an ex-partner who was the suspect. And crucially, this doesn't include the kind of so-called non-suspicious deaths to which Louise Tickle and others have alluded. Um, plenty of what could be called hidden homicides uh, don't make it to these statistics, which is obviously a big part of the point of this evening. Um, uh, and then if we go to the next slide, if we are, I suppose, to take any lessons from the solved cases of uh, women killed by men, you can see there is often a really pronounced domestic element. Uh, so 60, more than 60% 60 uh, of women murdered by men are murdered by Cohen's or former spouse or partner. And only nine of the 149 murders of women by men in 2018 were committed by a stranger or where there wasn't a known relationship. Um, and so just to broaden uh, the scope a bit to, you know, what's going on domestically, uh, to move on to the next slide. Um, if, if so many femicides are committed in domestic settings, what's the state of support? Well, more than 400 referrals a week to refuges in England are declined, and a great deal of those because of a lack of space or capacity to support the survivor. Um, and that lack of capacity is caused in large part by what's been quite a massive fall in local authority spending on refuges, um, falling more than a quarter between 2010 and 2017. Um, and then in the final slide, um, I think this just gives a sense of, you know, even before we get this, to the stage of domestic homicide, just how many offences we might be missing. Um, so of the 1.3 million domestic abuse related incidents reported to the police, 700,000 were deemed to be criminal offences, but just 78,000 ended in prosecution and an even smaller number, 60,000 ended in convictions, which is just four and a half percent of those initial 1.3 million uh, reports to the police. Um, and hopefully that gives some context. Zav, thank you so much for that. And Julie, I'm sure you can see there's a, there's a lot of um, respect and admiration for you and your family in the chat there. And so I hope you feel that you're, um, that there's some love and comfort for you in the room tonight. Um, Louise, I wonder if I can come back to you. Um, it feels like the moment for us to um, just talk about where you think systemic failure is and, and where you want to take the story. Just reflecting for a second on um, those slides, uh, I, I think the, the thing I wrote down is it shows just how re dangerous relationships are for women. <laughs> It's really shocking when you see it put like that, that only nine of all those murders were due to a stranger and yet they're the people we're told to be scared of. Um, so where do I think the story is? Now that this kind of comes from the reporting I've done on, on family law cases as well, but um, it feels to me that domestic abuse and coercive control and the risks that it poses is simply not taken seriously we talk about it a lot but the sheer level of threat that oh <laughs> there goes here come my kids the sheer level of threat <laughs> that <laughs> i'll be able to say this seriously um okay, do you want to come in do you want to come in why come in and say hello hello now that you've interrupted hey right. so the level of threat that is posed by by the kinds of relationships that people are in without, in many cases, judges really taking proper account of that. I mean, the number of times that people can breach protective injunctions where that is simply discounted when it comes to sentencing. And this is, this is not even a situation where somebody has been killed, but it's a situation where 
women mainly are living with a level of threat and violence in their lives that society both seems not to want to understand and where the agencies that are meant to protect victims are unwilling to fully take their responsibility seriously. And the questions as to why that happens are so systemic and huge about our society um, that it's difficult to, are you off? Yeah, yeah, okay. It's difficult to see how, it's difficult to see how to kind of grapple with that. But what, what I am really concerned about is, you know, the story that Julie has just told us and, and I have read the chronology, I have seen the police interview with her daughter, which is one of the most heartbreaking watches I have ever, ever viewed. Mm. Um, the level of abuse that the police knew about in that relationship, and yet still the assumption is when they go and see a young woman who has been found dead, is that they don't look at it as a potential homicide. It's, it seems, it, it's, the cognitive dissonance is so huge mm. that it feels like that's the space that I need to look at. It's like, why is this resistance happening? And how, and how often is it happening? That's the terrifying thought. And it, have, you, have you at this stage been able to do anything in terms of gathering the data on those breaches of protective injunctions? Because that feels like a measurable, a measurable thing. It's, not, a, it's mm. not an impressionistic thing. I don't know if that's collected and it would only be collected by individual courts, I would imagine. Um, somebody might be able to tell me something different on that. Um, those are the kinds of things you often see in sentencing remarks, for instance, or if somebody's solicitor happens to tell you, or if you're doing an investigation into a particular case, whether they're collected centrally, I'm not sure. Mm. One of the things that has, has struck me is that it feels like the way that um, domestic abuse is flagged um, on people's records is that it's flagged against the woman rather than against the man. And that mm -hmm. seems so shocking. It's, um, it's a factor that has come up in the case where, uh, in fact, a suicide um, is being investigated and, and where there's going to be a new inquest. And one of the pieces of information I, I kind of gathered from that is that although this woman had rung the police, and they had done, you know, they, they had kind of entered the records that, that, that the flags were, were on the women. <laughs> um, so, so not, I'm thinking about the implications of that then. That seems an incredible thing. So if, so if the man goes on to an, a subsequent relationship, there's nothing to connect. No, he's, he's not the flagged. Police. From my, my understanding is that he's not flagged as the danger. She's flagged as the victim. And that just seems incredibly ludicrous to me, given that, as we know, and as Jane pointed out, um, it's not a relationship that's abusive. It's a perpetrator who's abusive and we see it because they move from one to the next to the next to the next. I mean, that's that's that is. That is astonishing. That is astonishing. I, if only we had a, a professor in the room who had dug into a lot of cases and could see some trends for us. Um, <laughs> Jane, where are you? Can you see me? Yes, I can. Yes, hello there. Um, let's let's just let's just go in again because you were you were talking, weren't you, about police coroners, pathologists? Let's just um, let's leave the police till last and go for the other two. Tell me what tell me what you see that really um, concerns you. Well, um, I I think a lot of what Louise just said she hit the nail on the head there is that there there is this space where we're we've got a, a sudden death and there's there's a gap where a lot of people come in and look at it and make a decision as to whether it is suspicious or not now that could be the a, a coroner a, a pathologist a coroner's officer in fact in one case that I was looking at, or the police. Now, why is there such a resistance to saying that somebody with a history of domestic abuse, that this is a homicide? Where is that resistance uh, coming from? You know, when, when police go to a crime scene uh, or to a call, the first thing they have to do is identify if a crime has been committed and secondly, what that crime is and what we're, finding time and time and time again is they're not identifying any crime. You, you can have one, one case that I worked on with the police, the most horrendous circumstances, a woman was killed, I won't say in a how, but in a manner which you would say, oh my goodness, somebody's killed her. 
And the perpetrator said to the police, yeah, she did that to herself. Three years later, they decided to look at that case and say, oh, hang on, that's a bit suspicious. And do you, do you, do you think that's a, is that a resource issue or is it a no. culture issue? What is it? It's not a resource issue. I, and I, and I, I do, you know, people get fed up of, of, of hearing the same drum being banged, but domestic abuse has a very low status. It's got low status as a crime. The victims have the lowest status of most victims. And research has shown that women who cohabit with their um, per perpetrators, the people that abuse them, have the lowest status of all victims of any kind of violence or abuse. Mm -hmm. But we've also got we've we've got this idea as well that families don't know what they're talking about. They're just grief stricken. What do they know? We know best. We know best. And in, and I'll just briefly mention. Um, I, th I have got a whole list of things, but 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 one of the things that I thought was very interesting when I went to um, an SIO's conference, and the chief investigator at this conference said that it was their policy to um, start with no assumptions of or, or, of suspicion. And if then, if the uh, evidence came in, that they would then maybe start an investigation, by which time you've lost your crime scene, you, you've lost all sorts of things. I mean, surely we should, where, they're, where they followed the eight stages, where there has been domestic abuse, coercive control or intimate partner stalking, we should go in with the assumption that something's wrong and let it be proved otherwise. Let's do it the other way around. Yes. Um, thank you, Jen. Thank you. I, I'm going to just go quickly to a couple of people who are making very good points in the chat. I wonder if Heather Harvey might like to join us over this side of the wire. Um, you've been talking about um, campaigns for a, a DV register. Um, what, what, what do you think, Heather? Hi, uh, yeah, it's just um, they're not very well advanced yet, these campaigns, but there are calls for something like a domestic violence register of offenders, like the sex offenders register. But as I said in my comment, one of the issues is because there is a real failure to believe victims and there is a, a, a tendency for perpetrators to make counter allegations, often even before a woman makes an allegation as part of setting up his own analysis of himself as a victim and the police's tendency to take that at face value incident by incident rather than assessing the whole history and who's the primary perpetrator one of the dangers of a, of a domestic violence register is it would actually be used and abused by perpetrators and taken seriously by the police because the police are not very good at doing an assessment of who is a primary perpetrator. They are obliged to take everything incident by incident. The minute somebody reports something, they take that as an incident. They're not very good at looking at the patterns. My, and my, yeah. Excuse me, you go, you go. I was just gonna say, there's a, there's a program called Respect, which works with perpetrators and they do some really good work about trying to help police and uh, NGOs and services to actually look at uh, what is the actual primary perpetrator, who is in fear of what for the most of the time, and does it from a feminist perspective. But they have uh, very little um, scope or funding and, and it goes against the political grain. Unfortunately, there is a real desire currently politically to portray domestic violence as six of one, half a dozen of the other, gender neutral, dysfunctional couples, rather than actually an, analyze it as a, a issue of patriarchy and discrimination and state structures. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to chew on there, I'm afraid. Um, I, I wonder if we could go to Sophie Naftalin, because I, I think, Sophie, um, you're a solicitor and have worked in a number of these cases, aren't you? Hi, yeah, um, thanks for asking me to um, contribute. I will if I can. I also have some kids kind of lurking around the back. So. Um, so I'm a solicitor and I um, act for families in inquests, police complaints and civil proceedings. And over the last few years, I've developed an interest in this area and I've got a number of um, 
cases where um, a case has been assessed as being a suicide very early on and therefore important evidence has been lost because the police investigation has been inadequate. What I would say is from the work that I've done looking at what the police should do is that the APP, which is the College of Policing Guidance on Suicide and Bereavement, does make clear that actually on um, attending a suicide, that the police should assume that it's a suspicious death until proven otherwise. But in reality, what we're seeing is that very quickly, as Louise said earlier, almost in minutes, it's assessed as non-suspicious. And what that means is that the case goes to the coroner. There isn't a forensic post-mortem. Often important evidence isn't gathered. And what happens is that when family members who are sort of disbelieved at the time mm -hmm. later on raise these issues, essential evidence has been lost. So mm -hmm. there's already been a failing almost immediately, which is often something that cannot be recovered, as Julie was explaining in her case. Um, my, um, there are a number of inquests coming up and coroners have a very important role, I think, in terms of identifying the failings that are leading to these kinds of deaths and also to encourage good practice in terms of how police um, should be investigating these cases straight away. Um, so, and DHRs as well, to some degree, I think an issue with DHRs is that often their findings aren't properly disseminated. So we don't have an oversight mechanism at the moment where findings that come up are then kind of reviewed systemically. So that's another issue. Um, yeah, there's um, another issue um, that was raised earlier is about whether or not there's um, uh, perpetrators are marked up on the system. They should be. And having done a number of inquests where um, coroners have made prevention of future deaths reports, it's often to do with the risk assessment and the extent to which police officers with domestic violence cases are looking back properly at the history and undertaking adequate risk assessments. And what we're finding is that police officers on the ground do not have an adequate understanding of domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. And the risk assessment process is is failing time and time again because there isn't joined up thinking. Police officers are often able to assess crimes like um, assault, like robbery, where it, it requires just a simple analysis in, in the scene. But domestic abuse requires joined up thinking where you're understanding complex relationships that often take place over a very long period of time. It requires active policing it requires talking to people so there needs to be a complete shift in how do police officers assess um risk and yeah. assess um domestic abuse related offenses anyway i could talk yeah. for ages and ages and i'll stop <laughs> I, 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 there's a pattern here isn't there um we could we could uh, go on all night i think um thank you so much for that sophie i really appreciate it i am um, my colleague liz in the chat is just telling me that um the nicole jacobs is is with us who is um the domestic abuse commissioner for england and wales um nicole i wonder if you'd like to pitch in and um just give us a bit of a uh, your overview of the conversation we've had and what you think it um it, it throws up most urgently hi um i well i i know in um have worked with quite a few people who've spoken, and I, um, I've, um, I, I agree with much of what's been said, and particularly the last comments about where we need to 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 go in terms of all sorts of systemic failures. I guess I would just encourage, in thinking about this conversation, um, really concentrating on, you know, that's the thing about domestic abuse, I suppose, is we could start in all sorts of directions, kind of failure of um, enforcing restraining orders, frontline policing, all sorts of things. But I think it would be particularly useful, knowing the breadth of work that's going on to really um, focus on what Louise is really wishing to with this, which is about, are there, how many cases are there where we're failing to um, address the cause of the homicide or the death, whether it's a suicide or a homicide that's not being classified as such. And um, and I do agree very much that the role of the coroner um, is critical and the role of what the police are expected to do at the initial um, 
the, in the initial steps and in investigation. And I think we need um, some very clear clarification about what is expected to happen, mm -hmm. how that's expected to be recorded, all of those things. And I think if we get lost in too much, I mean, I, I spend all my day talking, as many people on this call do all of our time talking about this, but let's not get lost in the broad and very frustrating systemic failures in lots of places. And I, I think a huge contribution could be just identifying, like, do we really know or not how many homicides are, are in relation to domestic abuse or suicides in relation to domestic abuse? And can we recognize we have a lot of work to do in that regard? Um, I think that would just be a huge contribution. And it's clear that we all agree that a lot of work needs to be done, but it's something that, that is very, it's outside of circles like the people on this call, it's not being discussed or talked about. And, and so I really am glad we're having this conversation. And I just wanna make sure that, um, you know, just to encourage a little bit that we keep focused on this in particular. Uh, you've done a tremendous job of, um, of doing what this session is intended to do, which is to, to make a widely, broadly drawn injustice into a something that you can get your arms around something that you know we we can have a, a sharp focus to our work i suppose i, I mean I, it begs the question have you ordered up any of that work yourself oh well, i'd like to my my role if some of you will know is i'm a, I'm a designate right now that doesn't mean i don't i can't do anything i have quite a lot of convening power and i stay very active in government when the domestic abuse bill is passed um which we're waiting for a date in the house of lords right now the my office will have a statutory underpinning and some powers to request information from public bodies which i think is highly relevant to this discussion um, and to make recommendations that have to be responded to within a certain number of days so um, there are there is a femicide working group um, which again uh, quite a few people on this call attend and i've had a, we've had a good kind of initial session about what plans there could be um, in using those powers to the right effect for some of this work. So definitely it's, I've got my sights on it and, um, and I know I can't do it alone and or that people who are working in my office can't do it alone because we have the expertise we need as you can see on the call. It's just how could I use some of those powers to get at the information we need to have um, maybe more quickly and um, and how to really escalate and, and amplify some of these issues within government. So that's that would be my aim at this stage. I think, I think, I think you're 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 right to to pray in aid of speed in this area because it it feels like it's it's one of those issues that can disappear into into the long grass in in Whitehall uh, and it really needs. Um, someone with the determination to try and drive change that um that can force people to open their books and it does seem that you know one of the one of the lessons of tonight this conversation is that there is an, a, a tremendous amount of defensiveness throughout the process you know that people are justifying past decisions or or you know giving giving authorities um ample opportunity to to cloak themselves from uh, scrutiny I'm going to come back to Louise. Um, I, I should say it's now 20 to 8. I, uh, why don't we take five more minutes um, just to to bring this conversation to an end for this evening? It's certainly not going to be the last um, the last time we engage with it. I hope this is just the start of a, a body of work. And I hope Nicole, that once you're um, once you're um, properly um, you lose your designated bit of your title, um, you might be able to um, help us, and we can help you in getting to. Um, to the truth of this quicker well louise um just w why don't you um do the job that someone like me might normally do and just sum up this conversation and just um tell us where you think it's pointing us it's hard to sum up what um what julie said so i i, I won't try with that um julie i just want to say such an enormous thank you to you and to emma who i know is watching um for having taken part and telling us about katie um in terms of what Jane and Frank 
are talking about. I think they're both very concerned with the fact that the resistance there is to recognizing what is happening behind closed doors is something they have both pushed against for years and they've both demanded accountability for for years and they've both also tried to find very constructive ways forward so that police and agencies are better equipped to both anticipate and in the worst cases to then investigate um, what has happened when there are deaths which are due to or linked with domestic abuse. Um, I was scribbling madly, Nicole, as you were, as you were speaking then, um, because I think it is very important that um, this kind of work doesn't just um, wave its hands in the air and go, oh, isn't everything so terrible, but tries to push for and help develop and, and give a voice to the people who are trying to find constructive solutions through, because that is the only way that you get social change. It's the only way that this kind of, you know, terrible injustice um, can, can both be, you know, investigated, but also let's, let's face it, prevent it. Because if people are going on to, to murder, not one, but two women usually, um, and inflict all sorts of terrible harms on those they have relationships with, then the amount of misery in society is just exponentially increased and they, there are an awful lot of dangerous people around. Um, I, I, I really wonder how um, that call for, you know, how do we find out um, numbers of suicides and numbers of deaths that are related to domestic abuse, because kind of by definition, um, yeah, we've called this hidden homicides, kind of by definition, how do you know? I mean, I, I know that Jane um, is contacted by families who are desperate, um, you know, morning, noon and well into the night, telling her in great detail the stories of their children and what's happened to them and can she investigate. But there's no current, it seems to me, way of, of classifying these, um, unless I suppose maybe you were to have a police, a, a police service that was you know, more both inquiring and more willing to accept levels of ambiguity and report them where they where they were not sure. Um, I don't know how willing um, state agencies are to hold a level of uncertainty and publicise their uncertainty. But I think the fact is that in this kind of area, unless you are willing to be comfortable with your own uncertainty and lack of knowledge and need to educate yourself, then it's hard to move forward. Um, but I was intrigued by what you said, um, Nicole, again, about, um, you know, what are the kinds of steps that are perhaps the minimum that you might expect um, police and coroners, maybe pathologists, um, to take when, when, when faced with a death that is unexpected, where there is a history of domestic abuse. And I don't know if there is currently a standard um, protocol, perhaps, for, for how these things need to be looked at. Um, maybe somebody can tell me, but that, that's, that's sort of where, where I have got to, but I, I am so fascinated by what people have said today. Um, and thank you all. Well, yes, I, I can only echo that. I think, uh, you know, we hope in broadening this conversation uh, that we come out of the other end of it smarter and a bit more um, focused. And I, I really feel that we've got somewhere down that track today i think it, it was a it was a remarkable um testimony from you julie and i um it's going to live long in the memory for i think everyone who's been on this call it was a it was a really humbling thing to hear and and you know if ever um there was something to to crystallize what's needed then then it was to hear your story um i, I i'm just going to end it there. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for staying with us in such numbers. Uh, I think it's been a great conversation for us. It gives uh, Louise uh, definitely a notebook full and uh, that's always um, trouble for someone. So, um, you know, the next steps I think are um, going to be to unleash her. Um, thanks again, everybody. Um, I hope that um, you have a peaceful rest of your evening because it's a lot to a lot to deal with um i think that's a, an extraordinarily powerful conversation and um one we will return to and i hope that you'll help us get there 
Thanks very much. And uh, we'll speak, I hope, again. Thanks. <laughs>